let's get right to our next guest because I want to give him a chance to uh, unfurl his argument that uh, the fact college campuses are dominated by uh, leftist nihilists is good news and we shouldn't worry about it. Maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but we'll give him a chance to elaborate. John Tamney is the editor of RealClearMarkets.com, director of the Center for Economic Freedom at FreedomWorks, author of The Money Confusion, How Illiteracy About Currencies and Inflation Sets the Stage for the Crypto Revolution. John, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, so um, lay it on us. Why should conservatives stop bitching about uh, the campuses being uh, dominated by, uh, you know, uh, new Maoists? Well, for one, they overstate it by a mile. I speak on elite campuses all the time, and my title is The Unrelenting Genius of Wealth Inequality. And I've never been shouted down. Only one time at Oklahoma State years ago, a girl wouldn't shake my hand. Uh, these people who claim uh, liberal rot on campuses make a fortune every year speaking on campuses. And trust me, they're treated well when they do. So it, they're not as overwhelmingly left wing as everyone wants. Uh, the donor class to believe. But beyond that, let's just ask the question. Um, George Will always wanted to be an academic. Uh, academics aren't, as we agree, they're not as um, welcoming to right-wingers. Uh, how many millions more people did George Will reach as a result? Uh, Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx, is a big believer in free market economics. His library is full of it. Um, would we have been better off if he had gone back to Yale and been an instructor there and reached very few people or starting FedEx? Um, I think it's kind of bullish that people who love enterprise and free markets go out into enterprise. The fact that left-wingers dominate academia kind of is a statement of the obvious and doesn't worry me because most people go to college to get a job as is. They're, they're, does anyone, anyone really think they're listening to these teachers? I don't think so. Interesting. So, um, right. So Jamie Dimon goes to Tufts and then to Harvard for business school, where he uh, connects with Elizabeth Warren, who's a law professor at Harvard. Then uh, she goes on to be a senator and he goes on to be the CEO of J.P. Morgan. And they're collaborating to uh, prohibit cryptocurrencies. You mean like that? Well, look, it happens. There are certain people in enterprise that are left wing, but... Uh... What, what's your point? So because of an uh, because of an anecdote, we should say that this is bad, and that J Jamie Dimon was made left wing by L Elizabeth Warren. I'll point out to you. That well, wait, wait, you, all, you're you're giving anecdotes too. So I gave an anecdote back at no, you. No, I no, mean, but yes, I'm saying, yes, I'm, yes, I'm yes, saying, you were. Fred okay, Smith and George but, Will. Well, but and but I, I think my point there is bigger than. Okay, look what happens because George Will's not in academics. Um, he's reaching a lot more people. I think that's a better example. Um, I would point out that Elizabeth Warren historically uh, caucused with libertarians. The, the person, if you look at her records, the person she used to suck up to the most was Henry Manny, a, a giant among libertarians. Obviously, she's changed a lot. Uh, so what do you want to do? Um, our crowd generally doesn't go into academia. Uh, do you want affirmative action for them? Uh, do you think that we should no, force who, schools who, to no, hire who said, them? Who said anything about that? No, of course not. Well, okay. Well, so what would you like? You apparently think it's a problem. That, it is a problem. That, it is a problem. Well, so what would you like? What would you like to do? Um, well, uh, I, I mean, I would like uh, that the uh, conservative intellects in uh, the academic circles, and not just academic circles, but also practitioners uh, in the business world, who then could have a pathway to teach at places like Harvard or whatever, or the local community college, but they're, and, they do. Uh, and some do, and, and many are, are shunned and shut out because, of course, I mean, the, 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 dominance, the dominance of the left when it comes to everything but the hard sciences, but then they have the administrative dominance over the top of even the hard sciences, which is how they get polluted with the politics of race and identity as we I mean, the examples are legion. Um, and so there, there, there are smart people who are seeing this, and they're also um, presenting a competition, which is good, which is what I want to see, like the University of Austin, Barry Weiss, and the whole collection of academics that are moving in the direction of setting up a new university and all the other potential outlets when corporations start to reduce the bar or reduce 
I say I should say the credential bar to be uh, an employee, like for example the BA. So that will have an impact. So I, I'm I'm not looking for central planning to be the solution to central planning, but to suggest that you know a twenty to one dominance in the humanities of left to right. Uh, and in most other disciplines on college campuses, can, in addition to the, per, the administrative personal overlay and the, the diversity, equity and inclusion troops, um, that, that that doesn't have a cultural impact on America that also jeopardizes our free enterprise system, I think is very Pollyannish. Well, OK, but where do most of those kids uh, go after they uh, learn all these horrible things on campus? Uh, generally, I think I think there would be agreement here they go to New York, uh, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Um, I submit to you that those three cities are easily the most relentlessly capitalist cities on earth. So I, I think there's – again, I'm an optimist, and, and I, I think to be fair, you should be fair to me. What do I say in my column? I say let markets work, as in let people come up with alternatives. Yeah. Um, and, if, and if alums feel that, that, that they're promoting – uh, communism on campus or anti-Israel or whatever, uh, let them close their checkbooks. I, I make a specific case, stop whining, people. You're, you live in the greatest country on earth, and let markets work. Yeah, but, 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 but the problem... I point out, no, I, uh, but I, I think it's important to point out, where do these kids go and what do they do? What is more relentlessly capitalist and ruthlessly capitalist than Silicon Valley? I can't think of it. Just about every business fails there. If you miss a deal on Wall Street, you're out of your job that day. Uh, Hollywood, you would not. It'd be hard to find a more ruthless business than that. So watch what they do, not what they say. Apparently, they're learning to hate capitalism. Well, they sure don't show it once they leave college. Amy, you wanted to jump oh, yeah. in before well, I go. Well, one progressive councilman in San Francisco is blaming capitalism for homelessness. Uh, of course, there's – look, in a rich society, let's agree, there's all sorts of room for stupidity. I would go so far as to say the richer the society, the more stupid people they are. What did von Mises say long ago? He said that wealth creation creates an opportunity for those to demagogue it. So my guess is that if the three of us were running the United States, we'd have about 100 Elizabeth Warrens. We'd have 100 uh, Bernie Sanderses. And why? Because we would be for freedom, and in a free society, inequality is massive, and that's a beautiful thing. So, again, we can point to examples of, of idiot people, of course. But what I'm saying is that probably is a sign that people are a lot freer and far more profit-motivated than people want to admit. admit. Yeah, I also think there's a, a there's a late to the dance recognition of exactly what's going on in these civic and cultural institutions. And so, um, I mean, you know, this is a market, too. And I know you're going to give me the imperfect information argument and the market can uh, can address that even uh, in the 11th hour. But um, it, it, it's a problem because of the collusion with big government, uh, the, the one institution that has monopoly power and how the government has insinuated itself into all aspects of life and and is, you know, I mean, it, it, you have quasi government uh, uh, operators in the private sector that are further extending the reach of the state. And so there's sort of in a in a in a soft power way where the government obviously is the hammer. So, again, I just say, you know, you have a, a product that's coming out of uh, most colleges that is a, a shadow of a generation or, or of several generations ago, even a generation ago. And that makes for a less dynamic, less creative, less able uh, society. It also makes for a society that's less respectful of the uh, principles of liberty upon which it was founded. So the prospect of it, those uh, principles being extended to future generations is greatly is more uh, significantly jeopardized. So, I mean, I just I, I, I'm not I'm not saying that you're, you know, uh, oblivious to this. I'm just saying that to look at this in one aspect and say free enterprise and maximum freedom and just the relentless optimism of promoting those things is all we need to address and we can just let these barbarians behave like barbarians despite they have that they have control of all these institutions i just think you can't do that i can't think i don't think you can ignore who is in charge of these institutions and what they are begetting and just say that the free enterprise and the creative set are going to save us well uh, the first thing i would say is 
again, what, what, what do you want to do? Um, I, I kind of like to let people hang themselves as they're hanging themselves. And so if they want to say stupid things, I, I, I very much believe, passionately believe in the right for people to be complete idiots and pay for that in the marketplace. And as evidenced by what's happened at Penn this week, by what's happened at Harvard, they're paying for it in the marketplace. The other thing I would point out to you is, come on. People have been c- complaining about what they've been te- what they're teaching kids at school for as long as there have been colleges. William F. Buckley wrote God and Man in Yale in the 1950s. Are you familiar with yeah. David Lodge? He wrote the book Changing Places about Berkeley in the 1960s. Right. Uh, John LaRue wrote The Handmaid of Desire about massive left-wing wingerism at Stanford in the 1980s. The closing of the American mind in 1987. I mean, I get it. I've read the books. But I, so, when, so. I, when, I, when I ran for president of University of Texas in the 1980s on a platform of getting rid of affirmative action, I was shouted down as David Duke. So don't tell me that this is some new thing that we've been ignoring uh, this. This is what I've heard all of my life. My point is, is that people hear it. Yeah, campuses are wildly left wing in that fringe. But most people are there to meet girls and boys and get a job. Walk a campus with me anytime and tell me that it's just full of snowflakes in the fetal position uh, yelling against Israel. And it's just not a serious point of view. Harvard itself that's, that's, is over that, 30% that, 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 Jewish. That, that is a straw man argument. That's a straw man argument, John. What's the nobody, straw, what's the straw nobody, man argument? Nobody is saying a majority or nobody's saying that there are boys and girls there to meet boys and girls and get jobs on Wall Street or in Hollywood no, or Silicon Valley. Nobody's saying that. They're saying. Can I finish my point? Can I finish my sure. point? Of, of course, of course, we know this has been going on for a long time. Some of us who've been paying attention and a lot of us haven't been. Ken Griffin gave a half a billion dollars to Harvard before the uh, before what transpired after on that campus after October 7th. And then he's pretending to be shocked. Same thing with Ackman. And so it's uh, all of these other movers and shakers and elite circles. But but that's not even the point. The point is that we know from history that it's a committed few that moves things in one direction or the other, that moves things towards freedom or move things towards uh, autocracy. So it doesn't need to be a majority on campus and it doesn't need to be a majority of the electorate. The mo- it, it, all it needs to be is a motivated minority and there are motivated minorities that have done unbelievable damage to this country, moving in the direction of autocracy and away from freedom. And that's a fact too. I would say that these motivated minorities have done a, a horrendously bad job in the United States because we're the richest, most profit-motivated country on earth. So evidently, what they're teaching isn't getting through to kids. And I would just submit right. to you there's a tendency on our side to cherry-pick. And we're seeing it right now. I won't name the name, but there was there's a guy who was canceled last year. He may have been on your show. He was canceled by an elite university in Washington, D.C. He has made a fortune off of this. And let me be clear, I've known him for years. He has been speaking on hundreds of college campuses for years. And, 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 but suddenly, oh, my God, this, these, this a liberal tendency on campuses, yeah, that exists, but it, it's very fringe. Stephen Hayward, the author of, of, of The Age of Reagan, a, a committed conservative, what did he say about Berkeley in the 1960s? Yeah, it had this reputation as a hard left wing, but he said, realize that was 5% of the campus. That's just what the media reported on. And I think there's a tendency on our side to cherry pick these awful examples and say, oh my God, look at what's happening, the liberal rot on campus. And I would just say, go visit these schools. Most kids are not like this, and you can see it. And, and so, but what we're here, we're hearing about the fringe, and we certainly hear about it in our media. Um, all right, I wanted, I did want to get to this other topic. So let's just let's move to this topic because this is on inflation, and since uh, uh, Biden administration doesn't seem to understand that when prices uh, increase at a slower pace, they're still increasing. Um, the um, uh, the reaction uh, from the market and from the Fed uh, with respect to the inflation numbers this month is that uh, they've uh, tamed this beast and it's clear sailing ahead. What's your reaction? Uh, well, the dollar's weaker than it's ever been in history. And so I, I, my problem, and you know this from having had me on in the past, I define inflation as they've historically defined it, a devaluation of the unit. The dollar is the weakest it's ever been. Um, this notion of the Fed taming inflation is kind of a non sequitur. I thought, and, and I, I think I think you agree, uh, the idea yes. that you'd work, use price controls to fight 
to fight inflation seems kind of ridiculous. If you want to fight inflation, just have a, issue a stable dollar. Um, historically, they just define currencies in terms of gold, and, and, and that saved you from inflation. Prices move around all the time. Um, and so I think the problem and, and the sad thing is our side is unwill is has made this a political thing. No one's willing to define inflation as what it is. And so Biden, of course, yeah, he's just drooling things that make no sense. But the critics of Biden are, are, are saying similarly nonsensical things about what causes inflation. So I just wish we could have a real discussion of it. And uh, you were critical of um, Friedman's K rule, too. Um, I mean, just just for. A little edification. Um, address the um, uh, why you think Friedman. Well, I mean, I, I sort of know, but but address it anyway. Um, Friedman, you know, who was seen as the uh, one of the great libertarian economists of the 20th century, uh, and um, he there were some arguable missteps, but he still certainly advanced the the cause for freedom, generally speaking, and economic liberty and free enterprise. But on this issue of uh, moving off the gold standard and Friedman's response to basically uh, consistent money supply increase on an annualized basis, basically tied to GDP, why is that a bad idea? Uh, Because it's the presumption that you can plan the the, the amount of currency in a system to match production. Uh, no production currency in in a system is is production determined. Uh, why there's lots of dollars in Chicago, uh, very few dollars in Cairo, Illinois. Well, yeah, obviously there's no production going on in Cairo. Tons of it in Chicago, and so the idea that you can plan the amount of money in in a country, a city, on a street is as arrogant as Soviet five year plans. In in a re, as von Mises long ago said, you never have to worry about the supply of money in an economy. Where there's production, there will always be money. And, and so I'm merely making the point that um, Friedman was a central planner on this subject just as much as, as the Soviets were on, on other things. You don't plan money. You just def- you basically just let people produce, and there will be money. Um, right now, if you go to Venezuela, you better have dollars. The local currency is the boulevard. If you go to North Korea, you better have dollars, even though the local currency is the one. Did the Fed drop that money supply there a la Friedman? No, no. Where there's where there's goods to be traded, there's always good money. Oh, that's how Wall Street make, gets makes its money. That's how banks make their money is they finance the movement of real goods and services. And so I just think it's a mistake that our sides become so focused on presuming to know uh, what the the supply of money should be, how much money should be circulating. Markets do that for us. So should Mele be uh, uh, tying the uh, pay, the Argentinian peso to the gold standard rather than dollarizing the economy? Well, it's a great question. I argued in a column the week before last, I said, Malay doesn't need to bother to dollarize. Argentina's already dollarized. So what I would suggest is just legalize money because the dollar already uh, referees most transactions in Argentina. Why would you then bring the state in to decree what's already what's already real? And so, yeah, in a perfect world um, – they would just put the peso, define it in terms of gold, and then once you do that, you let markets set the supply of, of pesos. And if they go free market, rest assured, the amount of pesos circulated in Argentina will skyrocket because where there's lots of production, there's lots of money. Again, lots of dollars in Chicago, very few in Cairo, Illinois, and so it'd be no different in Argentina. I think the mistake is always that we presume a role for the state here. Uh, no, we wouldn't tell the we wouldn't have the state decide how many computers circulate in the economy. I mean, just to presume the state can decide how much money circulates is every bit as foolhardy. John Tamney, editor of RealClearMarkets.com, director of the Center for Economic Freedom at FreedomWorks, author of The Money Confusion, How Illiteracy About Currencies and Inflation Sets the Stage for the Crypto Revolution, if Jamie Dimon allows it. Uh, John, Tom, John Tamney, thanks for joining us as always. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me as always.